want to welcome you today on behalf of the Florence International Church in Florence, Italy. My name is Pastor Randy McGeehy. I'm one of the senior pastors of the church, and I have the privilege today of welcoming you and giving to you today uh, a message from the Word of God from the book of Ephesians uh, that will be the first in a series that we will begin today regarding maintaining the unity of the church. It will be taken from Ephesians chapter 4 verses 1 through 6. But before we get into our message today, I want us to take a few moments and just sit back and spend some time contemplating and worshiping the Lord as our worship leader, Dennis Chervo, and part of our worship team from one of our previous services will take these moments and invite us into the throne room of God just for a moment of worshiping and praising His wonderful name. As soon as that is finished, I will return with today's message. Ah, good morning. I'm going to read this morning from Psalm 67. And I'm going to read this from the Passion Bible. And this, I, I noted this verse earlier this week, and it, it has been huge. God, keep us near your mercy fountain and bless us. And when you look down on us, may your face be with joy. God, keep us near your mercy fountain and bless us. When you look down, may your face be with joy. But there's a reason. It's not just so, yes, we are blessed. The psalmist goes on. Then send us out all over the world so that everyone everywhere will discover your ways and know who you are and see your power to save. Now we're an international church. We just have to walk outside the doors and we find the nations. In fact, we don't even have to walk outside the door. They're in here as well. As you look around, you see several nations represented. But when you think about just in the Florence area, 10% of the population, that's the registered population, are from other nations besides Italy. So we have this incredible send us out to the nations so that everyone everywhere will discover your ways and know who you are and see your power to save. Let all the nations burst forth with praise. Let everyone everywhere love and enjoy you. Then, how glad the nations will be when you are their king. They will sing. They will shout. For you give true justice to the people. Yes, you, Lord, are the shepherd of the nations. No wonder the peoples praise you. Let all the people praise you more. The harvest of the earth is here. God, the very God we worship, keeps us satisfied at His banquet of blessings. And the blessings keep coming. Then all the ends of the earth will give Him the honor He deserves and be in awe of Him. God, keep us at your mercy fountain and bless us. Then send us out to the nations. Lord, we do need to start at your mercy fountain. 
for your mercy fountain. We drink from your mercy. And as we do your life, life, blessed life, begins to flow like a river.
the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, I would like to read verses 1 through 6, which we will use for our scripture text for this first part of this series of messages regarding maintaining the unity of the church. Beginning with verse 1, we find the following passage. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. The plea for unity today is the first thing that we will look at in regards to the beginning of this series of messages. In verse 1, Paul calls the church to remember where we came from and all that the Lord has done for us in Christ. He uses the word, therefore, to call to our minds all that he has taught us thus far in the book of Ephesians. He has been writing about the doctrine, precept, and belief. And now he turns his attention to duty, practice, and behavior. The phrase at the end of verse 1 that reads, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called is worthy and worth another look for us today. The word vocation refers to a calling or something like a career we might think of in this moment. It refers to a person's life's work. The calling we received from God to come to Christ by faith was not a call for a weekend getaway. It was not a call just to gather when we feel like it and lift our hands and praise the Lord. It was not a call just to spend an hour or so in worship and music and praise. It was much more than that. It was a call to live a radically changed life for the glory of God. We are called on to live differently, my friends, because we now know Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. We are to live lives that are worthy of what we have been given in Christ Jesus. Now the word worthy means to balance the scales. We are to live lives that prove we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to live lives that glorify Him in the world. We are to live such a weighty life that we balance the scales with God. Having told us what God expects of us, Paul now moves to tell us how to bring this to pass in each of our lives. He teaches us in these verses how to walk the worthy walk that we're called to walk. One of the clearest ways the church can prove the reality of what it teaches is by living out the essence of what Paul talks about through the book of Ephesians. He mentions it in verse 3. 
And he also mentions it again in verse 13. It is the idea of unity. The word means agreement. We are to be in agreement. It simply means that we are to walk together as one in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me just pause here and say that unity is God's goal for His church. It is meant to be the norm within each of our churches and our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And the book of Ephesians is about God's grace that reveals itself in our salvation. As a part of that process, the idea of unity comes into play. So consider the following truths with me today. First, God's grace, it unites the Trinity in bringing us to God. The Father chooses us unto salvation in Ephesians 1.4. The Son redeemed us with His own blood on the cross. Think of it. The Spirit seals us for all of eternity. Ephesians 1.13 describes that for us. God's grace unites Jews and Gentiles together in one body, the church, as described in Ephesians 2, 11 through 15. God's grace and salvation reconciles us or unites us to Him in Ephesians 2, 16 through 22. Notice these verses that speak about the issue of unity. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. This is Ephesians 1 27. We also find in 1 Corinthians 1 10, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. Notice that. The same thing, and that there be no, no, divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Romans 12, 16 states, Be ye of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. And then in Philippians 2, 1 through 4, we find the following instruction that says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye may be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or varying, varying, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem the other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own thing, but every man also on the things of others. And lastly, from 2 Corinthians 13, 11, we find this passage of Scripture that says, Finally, brethren, farewell, 
Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall, get this, shall be with you. If the Lord is that interested, my friends, in the unity of the church, then we should be interested in the unity of the church as well. In verse 3 of our text, we are called to keep or to maintain the unity of the church. I want to look into the teaching of these verses today. The fact is we are not always unified as we are instructed to be. We are not always on the same page, so to speak. We are not always pulling together for the glory of God. Too often we each have our own agendas that compete against the good of the church, the body of Christ as a whole. This text is a plea for unity. And I want to take these verses and share some challenges that I see within them. I want to share with you about maintaining the unity of the church because it is extremely important regarding the witness that we give out to those around us today. These verses teach us how to walk together, how to walk together as a redeemed family, the way God intended and even now intends for us to do. So let's talk about maintaining the unity of the church today. And we'll begin today by looking at verse 3, which talks about the plea for unity in the church. And the first point that I will make today is in that the words of this plea and their importance. Paul says, endeavoring, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. How? in the bond of peace. Several words in that verse merit our attention in this moment. Endeavoring, the word means hasty or zealous. It suggests that we allow nothing to hinder us from speedily striving to secure the unity of the church. It speaks of a holy zeal and that it demands constraint in its attention. We also find the word keep. This word means simply to guard. Notice that it does not say create. We cannot manufacture unity within the church no matter how we might try. We cannot fake unity as well. We can only protect or guard the unity that we, in fact, already have in Christ Jesus. Paul calls it the unity of the Spirit. This phrase reminds us that the unity and the agreement, the common ground within the church, is not the product of our efforts to make unity. This agreement, this common ground is that which is produced within us by the Spirit of God. We are to maintain this unity in the bond of peace. The word bond refers to a band or that which binds us together. Peace speaks of tranquility. It speaks of harmony. It speaks of concord. The belt that binds the church together in unity is, in fact, peace. When we are at peace with one another, we are able to keep the unity 
of the Spirit one with another. So the words of the plea are very important to us as individuals and as the body of Christ. The second point that I will make today is the, in the witness of the plea. The church has no greater testimony, hear me friends, no greater testimony than when we are united in Jesus in spite of our differences. All of us that are a part of an international church, an international body of believers coming from all different backgrounds and races and customs and traditions, we know what it is to be united in our differences. It's a must. By the same rule, there is no greater slander against the cause of Christ than a church family in which the members are at odds with one another. And we see this over and over and over again. And then we wonder why. Why do people stand back and not become a part of what we profess to be so wonderful and real? Listen to what Jesus said. He said in John 13, 35, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one for another. If you have love one for another. Also in John 17, 11, we find this passage that says, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. And then also in John 17, 20 through 22, we read this passage that says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. You know, we're a diverse bunch of people, <laughs> all with our own thoughts, our own purposes, and our own ideals. We are different one from another in every way that we can imagine. Physical differences, intellectual differences, economic differences and spiritual differences all compete against the unity we are expected to live with. Yet, with all our differences, hear me, there is common ground. When we came to Jesus, the Holy Spirit took up residence in our hearts. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. Romans 8, 9 also says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. 
Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. When he is in you, and he is in me, he can cause us to move past our differences and to walk together in unity for the glory of God. When we are at war with one another, we have lost our testimony to the world. When we walk out of the unity, we are telling them that we are no different than they are. You know, down through the ages, the world has formulated treaties and agreements held conferences and signed accords all in an effort to bring about peace and unity. Every single treaty signed by men since the dawn of time recorded has failed. Why? There is, as Isaiah 48.22 says, there is no peace saith the Lord unto the wicked. The world cannot find peace because they have no ground for peace. Friends, what I'm trying to help us understand is we are called to be different. The Spirit of God dwells inside every true believer to guard, direct, and cause us to produce what is referred to as the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, which always leads to peace within the church. When we walk in the peace we have been given through the Spirit, we magnify the Lord Jesus and we show the world that there is something different about us as believers in Christ. In verse 2, Paul speaks about humility, gentleness, patience, and loving tolerance. These are to be noted characteristics within the body of Christ in each believer. Every one of these spiritual characteristics flows out of a genuine love one for another. Every one of them comes from the presence of the Holy Spirit that is dwelling within our hearts. We will flesh those thoughts out in a greater detail over the next few weeks as we continue this series of messages. But for now, we need to know that God's will for His people is that we walk in unity, all pulling the same way for the glory of the same God. So, we've looked at the words of the plea today. We've looked also at the witness of the plea. And finally, we look at the wisdom of the plea. Walking in unity does not mean that we always have the same ideas about the same issues. We are individuals in many ways. We may have differences of opinion from time to time. That is both healthy and good if it is dealt with in a godly way. There needs to be a diversity of thought and not an intellectual or spiritual totalitarianism that dictates what every single person is allowed to think and to believe. Walking in unity does not mean that we will always believe exactly the same about every single issue where doctrine is concerned. It does not mean that we lose our individualism when we are saved. You are still who you are. 
It does not mean that we are marked by a common purpose. And in fact, it, in reality, it's meant to mean that we are marked by a common purpose and led by a common Savior whose name is Jesus. It does mean that when the Lord gives us His clear direction, we put aside our personal opinions and walk together for the glory of God and the good of the gospel. It does mean that the unity of the church is more important than me getting my way or you getting your way. It does mean that the unity of the church always comes ahead of my personal agenda, just as it does for yours. It does mean that the unity of the church comes before our feelings. Nothing shows the world that we are different from them in our walk any more than our being different in these specific areas. When they see us at odds, we can forget the gospel because we will not reach them for Jesus Christ. But when they see us walking in unity as it is manifested in true humility, gentleness towards one another, patient endurance of one another, and loving tolerance for our differences, it will do more to reach the world than any outreach program ever devised by mankind. Our unity says that we are real, that we are genuine. They may reject our truth, but they will not be able to reject and pass by our unity as they see. A gentleman by the name of Chuck Colson in his book, The Body, says that regarding that of John Calvin, Calvin who saw, saw that the devil, devil's chief device was in fact disunity and division and who preached that there should be friendly fellowship for all ministers of Christ, made a similar point in his letter to a trusted colleague. And I quote, Among Christians, there ought to be so great a dislike of schism as that they may always avoid it so fast as lies in their power. That there ought to prevail among them such a reverence for the ministry of the Word and the sacraments that whenever they perceive these things to be there, they will and must consider the church to exist, nor need it be of any hindrance that some points of doctrine are not quite so pure, seeing that there is scarcely any church which has not retained some remnants of the former ignorances. Calvin was simply reminding us that we are all wrong at some point in our living and in our theology. If we are right about Jesus Christ and the gospel, that is common ground from which we can operate and work together. It's wrong for there to be a division between you and me just because we disagree about some point or some doctrine. It is wrong for us to allow our personal opinions and our preferences, hear me, to drive wedges between us. It is wrong for me to hold so sternly to my views and my rights 
that I damage the church of the living God. We must never sacrifice truth for the sake of unity. I am not preaching unity at all costs here. Please hear me. I am preaching that we are to allow the love of God that is placed in us by the Holy Spirit to reign supreme in our lives and in our church as spoken of in Romans 5, 5. Back in the 17th century, an archbishop by the name of Marco Antonio de Dominus wrote this, in necessarius unitas, in dubius libertas, in omnibus caritas. This Latin phrase roughly translated to in, this, in necessary things, unity. In uncertain things, liberty. In everything, charity. That little saying speaks volumes, my friends. There are some truths that must be defended to the death, even at the cost of unity. There are some things that are open to interpretation. We're to give liberty to others in those areas and not judge them for their actions or their beliefs. And everything whether we can stand together or whether we must separate over our differences, every action is to be motivated by the love of Christ in us for the other person or individuals. So in conclusion today in this first part of our series, as a church, we have seen our share of disunity over the past few years. With a few exceptions, most of that has gone by the wayside in many ways. However, there are scars of that turmoil and those scars can still be visible. Some people who used to be here in our church at Florence and I'm sure and possibly the churches of whom many of you attend and are a part of are no longer there. And the church has suffered from their loss. We have also suffered spiritually and emotionally. And I am still saved today. How about you? If we are saved, the Holy Spirit lives within both you and I. If we allow Him to fill us with His presence and power, He will bring us to a place of absolute unity of purpose for, hear me, for the glory of God. When He does, we will see the Lord work around all of these things. Things that we possibly could never even imagine. As need to gather as a church, we need to ask the Lord to forgive us for our part in any kind of disunity that we have been a part of in the past. If we have offended a fellow believer and we are aware of that, we need to make it right. In verse 23 of Matthew chapter 5, also verse 24, it says, Therefore, if thou bringest thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thou, brother, hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way first, to be reconciled to the brother and then come and offer your gift. If 
we have been offended by others, we need to let it go. We need to forgive those who have offended us. In Luke 7, or Matthew, I'm sorry, Matthew 18, 21 and 22, we find this passage that says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? And Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Also in Luke 17, 1 through 5, this passage of Scripture rings true. Then said he unto the disciples, It is impossible, but, thou, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him, through whom they come. If it were better for him than a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast it into the sea, than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If, thou, if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day you turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And the apostles said unto the Lord, Increase, increase our faith. And lastly in Ephesians 4, 32, it says, And be kind, be ye kind, one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one to another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. I remind you, it does not say that if they're kind to you, it says you are to be forgiving to them regardless of how they respond or how they act. We are in this thing together, friends, and all we have is the Lord and each other. There must be love. There must be peace. There must be unity. I invite you today to go before the Lord in prayer and ask Him to help you to work together for the sake of unity, peace, and love in the Spirit and in the bond that we have together through Christ Jesus. If you will do that, He will meet you there. If you will do that in sincerity and determination, the church, the body of Christ, will begin to show a much brighter light that will entice and make a difference in the lives of the world around us. Would you pray with me for a moment? Father, we come before the throne today in the precious and wonderful name of Jesus. Lord, we recognize that it is by you, by your love, by your peace, by our salvation that you have so freely given that we have the privilege of coming together as the body of Christ and being what you have called us to be. But Lord, often many times we allow things and people to cause us to lose sight of the purpose and the reality of how and who we are. Lord, for myself today, I pray forgiveness. I ask that in Jesus' mighty name. For Lord, I know there are people that over the years there have been disagreements and strife and problems. 
And Lord, for whatever part that I have played in those situations, I ask you to help them to understand today that I want and desire their forgiveness. And Lord, if I can do anything to encourage that or be that, I will do it as you direct me to do. But Lord, I would pray that for all of us today, that we would become so committed and so determined to be in unity with each other that our testimony and witness would be so radically changed that people would come to us and ask us what it is that we have that is so different, so wonderful, and so special. Lord, we've done many things to make our witness of the gospel more difficult and more problematic. I'm asking you today to help us to cast those things aside and make our witness and our testimony something glorious and wonderful that it would show that we truly are one in you in the precious name of Jesus. So Lord, I just pray today that each one of us will reflect and be directed by your Holy Spirit so that we can be everything that you called us to be and the world can see changed lives through the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, I want to thank you today for what you're doing and what you will do in our lives. And to you alone, I give all the glory and all the honor and all the praise in your name. Amen. Thank you for being with us today for our weekly message. It is always a great joy and a privilege to share God's word with you. And I hope and I pray that in the days to come that this series of message will change us all to be more like what we were called to be through Christ Jesus. I invite you to join us on Wednesday mornings each week for our weekly devotional. You can find it, the link for it on Facebook at the Florence International Church. And uh, I just hope that it will be something to give you a bit of a midweek encouragement and pickup as you live your life for Jesus. And then once again, next Sunday morning at 8 a.m. Central European time, uh, I invite you to join us again, www.florenceinternationalchurch.com. We'll have the link for that, or you can also find that link on YouTube uh, on the net. We just count it such a great privilege to share God's Word with you, and we want to invite you to be with us each and every time that we meet. So until our next time together, may you be touched of the Spirit, may you be blessed by the Lord, may your lives be strengthened and encouraged as you endeavor to live out your life for His glory and for His purpose. We thank God for each and every one of you today. To God be the glory. God bless you.